Hello, everyone, and um, welcome. Welcome to this um, meeting uh, with the Center for Khmer Studies uh, in Siem Reap, uh, Cambodia. Uh, my name is Magnus Fiskefer. I am uh, from Sweden, but I work in uh, the US at uh, Cornell University at the Department of uh, Anthropology. And um, I'm also a member of the board at the Center for Khmer Studies uh, in Siem Reap. And um, I would like to mention to the audience before we move to our speaker in the webinar for today, um, uh, Mr. Yuk Sofiak, um, before I go to our speaker, I would like to mention that the Center for Khmer Studies uh, is a nonprofit, non governmental organization that works to promote uh, research, uh, teaching, and the public service um, in the social sciences, in the arts, the humanities, both in Cambodia and in the Mekong region. And uh, including to um, bring international scholarship and uh, Cambodian scholars uh, together, um, which is also what we're doing today. Uh, I invite you to um, uh, visit the webpage and find out more. You can sign up for newsletters. You can find out about fellowships uh, that are available. Um, you can also visit anytime. Uh, the headquarters of the Center for Khmer Studies in Siem Reap is located in um, the Wat Damnak a Temple Garden, uh, which is in the city of Siem Reap. And uh, there you can access uh, the library a very beautiful library and other resources uh, from uh, Monday to Saturday. And there's also a second office in Phnom Penh, which is, it can also be visited. Um, so you're all most welcome uh, to be in touch with the Center for Khmer Studies. And I thank everyone in the audience for being here today and coming to this event. We are very honored to have as our speaker uh, Sofia Kyuk, who is a PhD candidate in anthropology and cultural anthropology at um, the Institut National de Langues et Civilisations Orientales in Alco in Paris, uh, France. He previously received a Bachelor of Archaeology from the Royal Insti University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh and a Bachelor in Language Culture Society of Southeast Asia from Inalco in 2014. Um, uh, when he got a master's degree in uh, social sciences, arts and literature uh, from Inalco, that was in 2017. Uh, his current research topic uh, as a PhD candidate is from rice cultivation rituals to cultural identity, practice and value of the Khmer rice field, uh, which involves trying to understand uh, the enormous importance that uh, Cambodia and Cambodian people have uh, placed on uh, a rice culture and how that is currently uh, evolving. Uh, it is a, a fascinating topic and uh, I would like to say um, uh, a special welcome to our speaker and uh, I'm handing it over to you right now. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Magnus, for being my moderator today. And thank you, CKS, for inviting me to do the, my conference about my topic, research topic. So maybe I start to share my slide presentation. Okay. Okay. So for me, I'm interested in rice culture in Cambodia since my, I'm doing my master degree. So, and after that, when I start, I start my PhD, I think that why, we, why I don't do the rice culture in Cambodia, I should study about the rice because Cambodia it dries every day. Uh, for me, I, I like eating rice, that's why I, I love the rice so much. When, and I start to look at the bibliography, the references, 
many research focusing on the economic, the rice production, yeah, uh, something like that. But we don't know about the, uh, the rice cultivation in the village. Why we should, we should focus on something that the Cambodian people are doing right now. That's why I start doing my research and ethnographic research about rice in the Cambodian village. So for Cambodian, rice is not just a food, not just something we eat, but there are many things that related to rice. For example, uh, the rice has the proper name, the body and the soul, like human being. For example, my name is Sophia. This Sophia is my proper name, my body, I have the body and the soul because Cambodians think that they have 19 souls in their body. And the same for rice. I talked with Professor Angelian. He said, he told me that the rice have 19 souls like human beings. So it, the rice is something like uh, the human being in Cambodia. And if we look at the term for using in different degree of rice cultivation or in, in for referring to rice, we have many terms. For example, unhusked rice. In Cambodia, we call stro. In English, we have only one word. We have to add another word to uh, refer to something uh, uh, specific. But in Cambodia, for rice, we have different uh, terms. Stro is unhusked rice. On go, we call husked rice. Uh, Cook rice, we call bai. And Ho rice, we call bobo. Sikhi rice and vai rice. In Cambodian society, we differentiate all those terms. And when we talk the specific term, the Cambodian uh, people understand very clearly what we are talking about. But in English, we have only one word, it's rice. Yeah, because uh, the rice is not uh, something is special in English, but for Cambodian society, it's very special. That's why the rice has many different terms and the body, the soul, and also the proper name for Cambodian. And let's look at for the, the term for the right cultivation. When uh, the seed are called food, the seed for sitting, we call food in Cambodia. And when the seed grow, we call some nap. We, call, we cannot call food anymore, we call some nap. And when the young seed grow and uh, they plant in the in in, in the rice field, we call some tool. We, we pulling out the some nap and then we we plant again in the rice field, we call some tool. And here is because of nap. <laughs> it's different term for referring refer to the, the rice in Cambodia. And even the the, the rest that we, we, we cut from the rice field, there is at the word kanchirang. It's not, it's called the, it's not the rice tree. We call, in Cambodia, we call kanchirang. And I look at those words that show me that the importance of the rice in the Cambodian society. And furthermore, we, in Cambodian society, we eat rice every day, as I said. And I asked many villagers, they said, they told, they told me that if they don't eat rice, it's mean that they eat nothing. They can eat soup, they can eat burger, but they, they feel that they eat nothing. They have to eat rice every day, every meal when, when they, they eat. And for example, for animals, for animals in, in the household, for chicken, pigs, the dog, Every anim domestic animal, they eat rice, like the individual. So the using of rice in Cambodia society is not for human being, but for any domestic animal and for everything. And when, for example, when I get married, my mother, she will give me the land for rice cultivation, even though I'm in, in Phnom Penh City, I don't cultivate rice. But it is something that transition that that's still going on. 
And for example, if we prepare for the risk fuel in Cambodia, if we don't have rice, how we can prepare the risk fuel? Because the, when we invite many participants, we have to prepare something for them to eat. And it is always the rice that we are used to prepare the ritual. And uh, we have in, in Siem Reap province, uh, uh, when I do my research, I found that there are three rituals along with the rice cultivation cycle. So there is a ritual for starting a new rice cultivation season before starting the, to cultivate rice, we have a ritual. And for early harvest, we also have a ritual. And at the end, after we harvested the rice, we, the people do another ritual. So I will talk about these three ritual letters. Uh, I just want to, because most of Cambodians know that uh, during uh, Pol Pot or Khmer Rouge, uh, 1975 to 1979, all Cambodian they transfer all Cambodian to to grow rice at the village. So for me, it's something. The idea is that the true identity of my identity is inseparable from the right cultivation. When they got the power, they say that, oh, you go to plant the rice. So there's something is in those uh, those men that think that this, the true identity of my is going to grow rice. That's why they do like that. One of, I think, one among of the idea is to grow rice. It is my. So let's go to my research question. So Dr. Manu said, uh, talk about a little bit about my research question. So I saw there are many importances of, of rice in Cambodian society. And what about now? Now people use money. If we go to the market, we don't use rice. We use money to, to buy something. And I want to look at the importances that Cambodian has of a place on the rice culture has involved nowadays. Is it nowadays the rice is important for Cambodian people? So this is my research question. And my research focuses on only the family rice cultivation because I think that it represents most of Cambodian farmers. The Cambodian farmers don't produce a large quantity of rice. They're just a small farmer that think, I, I think I want to focus on those focus groups. This means family rice cultivation. And I do my research at Simbia province at a village called Bangkaung village. And I stayed there uh, almost one year with the villagers. And thanks to my host uh, family that they allow me to stay with them for almost one year. It's not common in Cambodia to, uh, to let someone to stay with you after many uh, war, civil war in Cambodia. And they are very uh, kind with me and let me to stay there with them. And I do my ethnographic research over there. So here is Bangkaung village. Here is uh, the Siem Reap province. It's about 15 kilometers uh, north of Siem Reap province. It's not so far from uh, the downtown of Siem Reap. And we can go by, uh, uh, by motor, motorbike. Or, uh, there is a road to, to the village. And here is uh, the, the village. There is uh, one Buddhist pagoda uh, and a public hospital, a primary school. Here is a school. And here is where I stay uh, with uh, the, the host family near the primary school and a collective hall. The collective hall is used to do the ritual uh, related to rice cultivation. And there is a collective lab that related to the right cultivation also. 
and there is two roads in in the village and the people live uh, near the road right now because there is a road that is easier for them to go somewhere so they, they, they live near the road so Bangkaun village has uh, 1262 inhabitants and according to my interview with the chef of the village because uh, people migrate a lot so that I, I asked the, the chef of village, village chef, how many uh, inhabitants in your village and they say 1,262 inhabitants and there are a total of uh, 343 families and what when I first arrived in in the village, they told me that we here we are net try. Net try means uh, right rover. And um, I asked the question that why this village is located near the city, about 15 kilometers from the city, why they call themselves net try. So the people uh, they, they use rye as essential element to distinguish between the social category uh, for those who are the rye farmer and those who live in the city they are not rye because they, they they live in the village and they grow rye but people who live in the city they don't grow rye that's why they call net grown and for them, uh, that try mean someone that know the tradition. And I I look at the, the the previous ethnographic research. For example, Marie Alexandrine Martin, that she she did a dissertation before the civil war in Cambodia, nineteen seventy, and she said the same. That try means some mean someone who know the tradition and for this idea still going on in the current day people think that they are not right they know the tradition and they uh, they preserve the tradition not only they know but they preserve the tradition but when i stay for about uh, two weeks one month I start to look at is the family economy in the village based on the right cultivation. So, according to my observation and my interview, villagers also do other things besides right cultivation. But what are the additional jobs for men and women and all people in the village? So, I am trying to distinguish for men group. I mean, the first group is the rye farmer and the men who make the handicraft. So the first group include men who grow rice in the village and also make handicraft. They work in the village without going to work in the city. And they often work at home. And many villagers are in this category. But uh, sorry, I don't have the exact, exact number of uh, the people in this category category so they plant the rye uh, once a year and at the same time when they have time they start they try to find uh, the uh, natural resource to do the basket and they sold this basket for six dollar three for six dollar this basket like this three for six dollar and those income help the family to cover the expense in the, their family and there is a buyer that come with a, a car every every month to collect those uh, those baskets to sold in thailand that, and the 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 most important is that they don't go to the to simply work they just stay at home cultivating rice and they do handy uh, they make the handicraft for surviving and for the second group those group there are many people mostly the young people 
they do they cultivate rice and also they go to the to the to Siem Reap province to find to, to do other jobs. Why they can do the rice cultivation and then they can go to Siem Reap to do other jobs because there is no contract in the job and they pay they, they, they are paid by by day. I mean, if you come to work, I will pay you five dollar for a day or six dollar for a day. If you don't come, no money for you. So they try to cultivate rice after the, the cultivation season. They go to work in Siem Reap province, and mostly they are young, under fifty years old, and there is no insurance, no contracts. Uh, and they go the, in the morning. They go to the downtown of Siem Reap, and at about four four p.m. they come back to the village. That's why they can have some time to uh, to go to the uh, to, to the rice field to to observe the growing of their rice. And here is the picture of what are they doing in the Siem Reap province. So there is men and women, uh, but no children. So the third group, what I'm, uh, I distinguish is uh, the people who migrate to Thailand to find a job. So the same, they don't have the contract for, for doing their jobs. They just go with, uh, they have connection, they know someone in Thailand. So they said, oh, there is a work in Thailand, so you can come. So they go with their, mostly they go with uh, their family. I mean, the husband and wife go together. That's why we, they can uh, uh, save the money. If they go alone and the wife and their children are in Cambodia, they cannot save a lot of money. That's why they prefer to go together to Thailand to work in the farming. And those farms are located near the Khmer Thai border is not uh, so far, but, uh, but the most important, they have to abandon the rice for a moment because they cannot uh, come back to the village. So they stay there, they abandon the, the rice cultivation, and, but they don't stay for a long time. One year, they stay only seven months or eight months, and then they come back to Cambodia. And next year they go again. And when they save, they can save a lot of money, they stop going to Thailand for to find other job. They just stay in Cambodia and doing rice cultivation again. And the fourth group, I think, is the elderly. And the elderly is uh, the people is over 60 in the village and they don't work anymore. And normally they often live with the, the youngest daughter and they spend their time at the uh, Buddhist pagoda and helping like to, uh, helping, uh, to look after the grandchildren uh, at the village. So these people can have the young to go to the city to work because they can look after the grandchildren at home. But most of their time is they spend with, at the pagoda, Buddhist pagoda. So, in, so we can see that all people, except the people who migrate to Thailand, they can they, they do right cultivation. But at the same time, they have the other job to, in order to cover the expense in the family. And what I saw, what I saw in the village I work, they, the people that go to Thailand, they don't sell their rice field. They, they don't want to stay in Thailand for a long time. As soon as they have a lot of money, they go back to the village to cultivate the rice. And I saw that the rice is mainly used to feed the family, but to produce it, they need money to pay for the tractor, to pay for the material, to pay for the fertilizer to use in the rice field. So they all they, they, they need to earn money 
in one way or other way, either by working in town or producing the the basket in the the, the village to get money. So two profession that it complement each other. They go to produce rice for the family consumption and they need money to in order to pay for the bill, to pay for the fertilizer uh, in order to cultivate rice. I want to let you know that uh, people who have rice, he have the rice field in the village, but, but they don't cultivate the rice. And other people said that those people, they are very lazy people because they have the right field, why don't they cultivate the rice, the right field? So people think that they are the lazy, lazy person. But for example, if I'm a goat ride rover, people will say that, oh, he is very uh, serious person. He worked very hard to cultivating the rice. And there is a reputation in the community for the someone who uh, got at rice cultivation and somewhat, someone who don't want to grow rice, even they have the rice field. So now I move on to the, the technique that the people in Bangkok village that are, they are using uh, nowadays. Uh, before we have in, I want to to you to know that there are two techniques uh, for the musong uh, for for the cultivating the rice. The first one is called uh, transplanting. Transplanting is the traditional technique. And why now now today there is other technique that's called broadcasting technique. And the people in Wang Kaung change from transplanting to broadcasting technique to cultivate rice in the village. And I will explain why they want to change uh, from transplanting to broadcasting technique. And I look at the ethnographic research before the civil war in Cambodia, for example, Gabriel, Gabriel Martel, a friend researcher who, who conducts uh, his, her PhD dissertation in Siem Reap province. She said that the, the villagers use transplanting and just a few family, they use uh, broadcasting. But right now, uh, the te those techniques are changed to the broadcasting. For, I think the shift to broadcasting method is not simply a change of technique in dry cultivation, but reflect the change of the whole society. And I try to explore this hypothesis. So right now, the, the villager has a small tractor like that to clothing uh, the soil. And we start to plant the rice uh, in May. I mean, when there is uh, the first rain, we start to clothing the, the land. After that, they wet, the farmer wet until the soil is wet uh, to have a, a bit, a little bit water in the, the rye field. And they start to do the plowing uh, the second time with using this small, small tractor. And after the second plowing, they start to sow the, the seed. Is start sitting by broadcasting of the, the grain. And after the broadcasting, they wait about uh, 45 days. And at the left side, there is picture the, 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 the rice, the, the, the young rice plant grow about uh, 30 to 40 centimeters and they start to close the rice again to decrease the density of the rice. And here is the results of after flowing the, the young rice, the young rice plant. Because we cannot leave those rice plants grow because there is too many uh, 
uh, rice plant in the village. So they need to decrease the density of the rice. That's why they need to close uh, the, the rice plant. So that some are, are dead and some will grow after two or, two or three days. So after proving the, uh, the young rice plant, so here is the result. So there is a space for the rice plant to grow. And people say that this method will give uh, uh, the gel, better gel. If, if we don't do the flow, clothing the, the young rice field, it, we cannot get uh, better, good, good gel. But right now, what I noticed that people don't use a, a natural fertilizer. And this is, a, I, I call chemical fertilizer because they just uh, bought, they just buy uh, those fertilizer from the market. And I look at the ethnographic research uh, before the Civil War. People in the village, they use uh, natural fertilizer. They don't buy uh, so many uh, fertilizer from the, the market. But right now they just do use this thing and just for the rye field. And they don't produce that natural uh, fertilizer anymore. It's very rare what I noticed in the village when I was there. And normally the harvest is in uh, November and we don't have uh, the machine, machine to, to, to harvest it used by hand. And we have to pay. What I noticed that there is no mutual aid in the harvest. They need to pay for, for, for the, the work. Even we have a mutual aid, it is around the family member. If I have many family members, we can do the mutual aid. But if I don't have uh, many family members, we have to pay for for harvesting the rice field. So there is a machine to separate the rice plant and the grain. And here is the result that we put the rice in the house, inside the house. It's something very uh, valuable for Cambodian. That's why they put in the house. So here I try to do um, like uh, the activity and the cost for for the the rice cultivation. I saw that broadcasting technique, the new technique that the villagers are doing, they spend less. And for example, for this is for one hectare per hectare of land. For stand planting, they need to spend 272.5 US dollar. And for broadcasting, they spend only 167.5. So they spend less for this new method. And people told me that transplanting, we need to spend more time for one hectare of the land. We have to spend at least one month. Why we need to spend a lot of time? Because we, uh, we have to do mutual at it means uh, other people will come to help me for three days and then I go to help them for three days. But right now we use a small tractor and we use broadcasting. We spend very little time. In two or three weeks, we can uh, finish uh, the right field and then go to work in the city. One more thing. Right now, even though people want to transplanting, to do a transplanting technique, they cannot do. Because one day, when they want to find the, uh, the people to, to help in the rice field, they cannot find. Because after each family, after they finish their rice field, they go to work in the city for, for, to, to gain money. So they cannot find someone to do the mutual act. So, Everyone must do uh, must must do broadcasting technique. 
and I want to let uh, I want to uh, give remarks on the the yields of the these two techniques because trans according to my uh, uh, interview with the villager transplanting give more yield almost a double of the the production why the broadcasting gives only half of the amount what they use with transplanting technique so they they now the people use the technique that give uh, a lower production in dry cultivation and for the the goat harvest they can get around two thousand per hectare but if they there is a, a problem of the weather there is no water they can get only one thousand per hectare or less than that and so so to summarize there are many changes in dry cultivation in the village the first thing is the tool for rice cultivation. They can produce, they can do the rice cultivation uh, faster because they have the tool, the mechanic tool for rice cultivation. And the change in the rice cultivation techniques, uh, we have people must do the broadcasting because they cannot uh, have the mature air and they have to work in the city. But they don't abandon the rice, even though they, they have to work in the city, they, they don't uh, abandon the rice cultivation. And what I noticed is the rice farmer use a lot of uh, chemical fertilizer. And for family economy, right now, people cannot depend on rice alone, rice, rice production alone. For example, my host family in 2018, they, they, can, they got uh, about 30 bags of rice and it's equal about $650, $650 for five members. They cannot use those $650 for a year for five members. That's why they need to do other things to cover the expense in the family. And they told me that for one month, they got almost 10 invitations for, uh, for the ceremony, marriage ceremony. And each invitation, they need to spend about $10. So 10, 10 invitations, it means $100 they spend for the ceremony. So how they can find the, the money to, to cover the, the invitation. So the job in the city is help them uh, to, to go to, to join the, the, the ceremony. So here is the rice cultivation season from June to December normally. And I want to point out that the people have to work in the city to, to cover the expense and the right cultivation alone cannot uh, feed the family to cover all the expense in the family. But for Cambodian, uh, there are three rituals people still, uh, still practicing three rituals, even though the economic change in the society, but the ritual stay in the village with the villagers. I mean, before starting the, the right cultivation, there is a ritual called Chlong Chai. And for early harvest, we call Aumbok. Everyone in Cambodia you know about this term. And after the harvest, uh, right harvest, we call Phun Phnom Trai and Lai Mie. So this ritual is uh, facts are practicing in the rice cycle, rice cultivation cycle. So here is uh, the image of a uh, long child. Uh, they, they do at the uh, uh, 
festival house, collective house in the village. And our unbox, unbox, uh, uh, it, unbox is the, the early, very early rice in November. We, we, we can uh, uh, harvest the rice and they, they, they use it to, to make unbox. And the end is there is a pool from trail. Uh, and again, the, this ritual is done at a festival, festival hall or collective hall uh, in the village, not at the pagoda. Okay. So today I'm, go I'm gonna talk about uh, the last ritual for Poon Trong Trau, I mean the ritual for after the rice is harvested because the those three rituals is very long and I have uh, only one hour to do the presentation. So I choose the last one to talk about that. So, so the ritual takes place uh, for, for, take for three days. People in the village will do the ritual for three days. The first day is the uh, uh, the people go to uh, fishing the rice, or oh, fishing the the fish. Sorry, fishing the fish at the uh, collective lake. There is a collective lake that, uh, as I I told you uh, before. And the first day we go to all people, even the children, women, and the men go to fish. Uh, to, to do fishing at the collective lake. And this lake is very special because according to my informant, they said that there is three neta that is uh, that that stay uh, along uh, this this lake. And people that the people cannot go to to fish. Uh, uh, no, normally they cannot go to fish. Only one day before the ritual, they can go to fish uh, there, and they, and uh, the the fishing uh, is led by the village chef. So the fishing is start from seven a.m., but I noticed that people came uh, around four a.m. in the morning to and wait for the fishing ceremony, and they are very happy. Uh, and each family uh, they they can they can fish around two kilograms for the office, and those fish will use for the ritual that we'll do uh, tomorrow. Here is the picture. So the the, the land is about two hectare, around two hectare in area. So. This is the picture of the man who is helping to fish for the for for the ritual. At first, they fish for the family, and after that, they fish for the ritual collective. And because we we have to cook the food at the collective hall, so that's why they have to they need to resource food resource. So the man have uh, to collect. To, to fish together for the for the collective hall. So here is the fish that they got. There are many fish uh, you can see. And this this fish are used only for the uh, collective ritual. They cannot uh, bring the fish to their home and uh, and they can eat so I, I want to show you about the uh, what it looks like uh, after organizing a ritual uh, uh, ritual right, right ritual in Cambodia. There is a hall number one, two, three. Number one here, I cannot point. Number one here is uh, the statue, Buddhist statue, Buddha statue. And number two here is uh, where the monk sit. And number three is the, the participant. Here is the, 
the form of the collective force at the village. And number four, people make uh, like a, a place that they say that this is the in French we call hotel de direction. Uh, in English we call uh, I mean the place for the direction because we have eight direction, card cardinal direction and inter cardinal direction. So this uh, this we, we put something here to to say that ah is the the east south or north. After that there is a uh, like paddy mound because after the harvest every family they got the rice so every family they bring the rice from their home to build five paddy mound and people say that those paddy mound uh, refer to the uncle tower because uncle tower they have five tower and they do the same thing at the village and number eight here is uh, where people install the banner of the ritual. So there is many ritual uh, in in for for the right ritual. The first one we call the people in uh, the steam rear call prong belief. So. Uh, according to the villagers, the space and the land are under the control of the spirit, and properly is considered the deity to whom the land belongs. Therefore, be before doing anything to the land, one must ask his permission by performing the grid. And after doing this ritual, people hope that strongly will uh, give blessing and happiness. And they also believe that if the, this ritual goes, uh, they also believe that the other ritual will go smoothly of the rest of the ceremony that will uh, go. I mean, the rest of the ceremony will go well. If they don't do the ceremony, the other ritual will, will go not smoothly. That's why you have to ask the permission of Phong uh, Pili for, uh, for his blessing and for the happiness of the all participants. However, there are many interpretations of this, this the meaning of this ritual. For example, uh, Professor Ang Julian and uh, Madame Madeleine Chinto also give the explanation of the Prongpili and it led it to the Brahmanist uh, deity and many uh, uh, histories in Uncle uh, uh, era. So I will not go to the the meaning of the uh, the this, the meaning of the, uh, the, the, the discussion of the researcher. I just give you the explanation from the villager. That is what I um, want to show you. The people they think that ah oh, we will do that we will organizing the ritual very smoothly and everything will go well there is no problem in during the ritual so that's why they conduct this ritual uh, during the right cultivation ritual after that they start to uh, uh, to install the banner at the village. Uh, and one one more thing is interesting that uh, the the this these people the villager have to give offering to the the guardian spirit at the village. Uh, the the ritual takes place at the collective hall where there is a, a Buddhist statue, but at the same time they also have to give the offering to the guardian spirit. And when I asked them why we can, uh, you just give the offering to the Buddha, why they uh, need to give the offering to the guardian spirit at the village. They said that uh, they have to give, this is the, their tradition. Our tradition is uh, we do offering to the Buddha and also giving uh, something to the guardian Spirit. If uh, we don't give uh, something to the guardian spirit, uh, 
we call that part the he will be angry and they he caused uh, the disease uh, to the participant. Uh, so there is a, a much uh, tradition. It means something related to the Buddhist and something to the, the related to animism, the, the guardian spirit. And the monks are invited to join the ceremony. And normally we invite the monk that uh, the village attached to, and we we borrow also the material from. Uh, from the, the pagoda. And this is, I think this is very special for, uh, for the rai ritual because I, I just saw that people bring the, the, the rice to build the Paddy Mount. And they do, they also do, we call the consecration of the Paddy Mount. So, I, I talk with the, the elderly at the village. Sometimes they bring like uh, um, the grand, they, they take the grand to their, their house to plan next year. So that's why they, it is uh, like something uh, secret. They do the consecration of the party mount. And after that, they Take some some of the the rice to their home and to to plan next year. So the ritual uh, uh, have two day. They do the ritual for two day, and this is the sec uh, the second day of the ritual, which inviting uh, the monk to have a breakfast in the morning at seven a.m. Yeah. And after that, they give the offering the right to the mang bowl, and they don't abandon the the, the spirit guardian spirit. They have yesterday they also give the offering to the guardian spirit, and today they give the uh, the the, guide, the offering to the guardian spirit again. Hmm. But I told them why they don't go to the place of the where the guardian spirit is. They say that uh, if you can give uh, them here and they, they know they will receive the offering. And after the cons consecration of the Paddy Mount yesterday, today, uh, tomorrow, the, ne the next day, the, the, the master of ritual have to do the ritual and at the ritual that call this con desecration of the party mount. I, I asked that why they do the consecration and after this desecration of the party mount the next day. They said that if we don't do the desecration of the party mount the next day, we cannot use this rice. And after the this, after the desecration of the party mount, the rice is uh, fertilized and we can take this dry uh, for planting for the next year. But uh, what I saw, the, this, this guy will give, uh, will give to the Buddhist man. But I saw some, some people collect some, some a small amount of rice and take to their, their house. So what I want to say by showing all those pictures is that we saw that the right cultivation is still important for the, the villagers, but in the different way. It means uh, they try to preserve the tradition by cultivating the rice, even though they cannot produce the, the rice production, cannot uh, cover all the expense in the family, but they try to adjust what, with different uh, techniques broadcasting. That's why they have time to do at the job to find the, the money to cover the expense in the households. And even the economics in the family is changing, but the right cultivation ritual is not changed. It's changed a little bit. It means it changed to the, the Buddhist. Before people say that we do the, the right ritual with the guardian spirit, we only do the, uh, the ritual with the guardian spirit. But as we saw right now, the ritual are oriented toward Buddhism. 
and he invite the monk. There are many uh, Buddhist uh, ritual in the ceremony, but people try to preserve the tradition. Is they have to do three times the right ritual in the village. So thank you uh, for your attention. If you have any question, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, fascinating um, um, uh, presentation. Um, maybe uh, thank you, and maybe you can leave that, uh, put that slide with the, your uh, references. Of, uh, you can uh, go back to that for a minute in case anyone wants to in the audience wants to have a look at that. Thank you very much. I believe you mentioned some of these sources in in your presentation. And um, we have um, some questions uh, in the um, um, uh, in the in the Q and A um, uh, box. Uh, I would like to invite uh, everyone in the audience, if you have more questions, to write them there, and uh, we will try to um, to get to them. Um, I thought I would I would like to start um, uh, to ask a question um, about history, um, maybe in um, in uh, two parts. I'm I'm curious about the the long the long history of rice cultivation and um, the sources of of water, um, as I've read about how in history there's been. Uh, droughts and um, difficulties having enough water uh, back in Angkor times. This happened. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, um, so I'm curious if uh, from your presentation, uh, I, I uh, it seemed to me that um, the water is mostly um, from above, from the clouds in the shape mm -hmm. of rain. But uh, I wonder if there's also um, irrigation using flood water uh, that's uh, coming from um, rivers in the area. And um, if there is um, uh, any tradition in this part um, of Cambodia of using water tanks to save water, to be able to use it um, over a longer time, or if this is uh, not something that figures in this area. Uh, you uh, probably know there's been a long, long discussions about uh, this kind of water tank and uh, mm. how they were used in history. And I'm curious if they have a local history in this area that you investigated. Are there also such water tanks? And and um, back in history, uh, where did the water come from? How did they um, uh, solve uh, the the need? How did they um, Make sure there was water when when uh, the farming um, when the farming needed it, mm. and so that's that's my 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 part one. I wanted to ask about this long history of the use of water and how that has changed. And I thought uh, before we get to uh, uh, some of the questions about the recent history, I saw someone was asking in the in the Q and A. I also wanted to ask uh, what happened in this era during the civil war when um, farming was disrupted there was probably collectivization forcing villagers to go and farm in collectives and so on and i'm wondering if there's um if that experience plays a role in um, in the thinking of the farmers today about how they how they organize their labor today uh, if they remember that period when they were forced to do things in a different way. Yeah, so I'm curious what you think about this long history and where the water came from, and also what happened during the Civil War. Thank you so much, Dr. Magnus, for the question. For the first question uh, regarding the water, uh, the, the villagers, the Hong Kong villagers uh, depend on the rainy season, the rainy. There is no uh, water tanks in, in the village. There is a small canal in the village, but those canal depend on the rain. 
the rains also depend on the rain. If there is no rains, we they don't have the water. Like in 2017, there is there was no rain at the village, and the rice plant uh, was was de were dead, and mm. each family they lose a lot of money. For example, once informant they said they they cultivate three hectares of uh, rice, but they get they got nothing because of no rain and they cannot do anything. Yeah. So and what they are doing is the rice ritual. During the rice ritual, I I saw people ask, uh, I hope that this this year will uh, have a lot of rain. That can be. That's why we can. Uh, uh, do the right cultivation only uh, like ritual uh, act for asking the the water for having the water and there are no other alternative to have the water at the village and for the second question uh, for for the for the Phnom Penh citizen maybe we say we say that they forced to go to the rice field to do the cultivate rice but for them, they cultivate rice all their life. So they, they, they are not like uh, forcing to cultivate rice. They just have to migrate to the to other area to do the rice cultivation. But uh, people say that after the Khmer Rouge regime, they come back to the village and they cultivate the at the rice field where they, they were. So there was no the the land uh, uh, I mean uh, some place they have to give the land to each family which family they got what how many land that uh, we will uh, receive from the chest of the village but at Bangkok village they said that they just come back and they do what where they 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 were uh, doing at the rice field there is no uh, land distribution in the village this this is what uh, the people. Say. Thank you so much. Let's go Thank to the um, questions from the audience. The first one was from Farsi Res. Um, you can see in the Q&A, he asks, uh, when have the changes you described in your presentation uh, started? Was it mm. 10, 20 years ago? And uh, why did these changes um, happen? Um, how do these changes alter the culture of rice cultivators? Mm. Uh, thank you, Fasi Reyes. Uh, based on my interview with the villagers, this new technique broadcasting is new for the villagers and less than 10 years. And the, they saw the other people uh, it, in other provinces uh, do that, that technique and they try to use that te technique in their village. And when I asked why they, they they change the technique. Why don't you do transplanting? Uh, because you can get more production. And uh, they say that uh, I cannot do that because uh, there is no one to help, and it takes time in the uh, it takes so much time uh, to do the transplanting. That's why I prefer to do a broadcasting technique. But this is the answer from the, the interview. But I, uh, what I'm thinking, what I try to point out is that the change in technique refer to the change of the society because the society change uh, to the economic uh, with money, with using a, a lot of money in the village. Uh, people have to uh, pay for the, for the material, pay for the, the work pay for school. So the chain of the society works in economic of that basing by using money. For me, I think that's why the people try to stop the transplanting to broadcasting because broadcasting uh, take less time. We just spend two weeks at the right field with uh, the help of the mechanical tool, and then we can go to find a work where we'll get the money. So this is why I think uh, uh, why they have to change uh, to the broadcasting technique. But what I'm trying to point out is that the ritual are still important for the villagers at the at Bangkaung village. Thank you. 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 Thank
they try to preserve the ritual, but even though the ritual are oriented to Buddhism, but it's no more because the every almost every, uh, each 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 village attacked to one pagoda in Cambodia. This is uh, uh, the common uh, thing in Cambodia. The right the ritual, this right ritual are oriented to Buddhist uh, uh, pagoda, and they try to preserve uh, this this three ritual in the right uh, cultivation cycle. I don't know if I read. I reply to your question. Well, um, uh, thank you. There's a uh, couple of questions about uh, the rituals that you have mentioned. The one from Mark from the US asks, are the Bon Phnom Srof rituals practiced in all villages around the country of Cambodia? Or is it uh, special or locally? Uh, I. I think at the provinces may have at the ritual, but what I present today is just the ritual that uh, takes place in Simbi province. Uh, in Simbi province, I saw many places uh, that have three rituals like that. It can uh, have a different name, but in three uh, before, early, and after like that. It is the common thing in Simbi province. But I, after my uh, research, I think I will go to other province to discover what the other province will do uh, for the ritual. Thank you. And um, uh, yes, can we just jump ahead uh, one second to Farsi Reyes asking a second question. You mentioned these three agrarian rituals. Yes. In which space, could you mention again, in which space these rituals were conducted? Are some of them conducted in the rice fields or are, are they in, in the village, away from the fields? Uh, the ritual uh, is conducted at the collective hall. Uh, uh, in Khmer, we call, uh, uh, sometimes we call the large hotian, uh, and the collective heart of the village. In Siem Reap, we saw each village have a collective hall to do the ceremony in the inside the village, not in uh, in the rice field. And mm -hmm. in the collective hall, there is a there is normally a Buddha statue uh, in 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 the hall. I see. Yeah. Um... Okay, let's jump back to Siri Torn Sirivan. Uh, there's a, a question. Um, I'm not sure that I can read this. Um, can you take a look at the question? Maybe you can read it. Yes, yes. Uh, what does it mean to be a try in the community to work with? And is this a narrative circulated in at the right community? In that region, in that region, yes. Uh, next time, mean for after based on my interview, next time means someone who know the tradition, as like uh, Alexandrine Matang, she said in her thesis before the civil war, and they are happy to, with the word next right now. They said that I'm next I know the tradition, and some people in, for example, they. Sometimes they say the uh, uh, people in the city because they they wear very short shirt uh, something like that. They say they don't know the tradition. We are here. We are Nyastra, We know the tradition, and they try to preserve uh, uh, what what uh, what they are doing before the tradition before. Uh, then uh, we go to Courtney work. Hello, Courtney. Um, uh, and nice to see your name here. Uh, Courtney says, lovely talk. Thanks for your nice research. I have a question about the 30 bags of rice at a value of $650. Is this rice that people sell after they have kept enough for themselves to eat for the year? Or are they selling rice and then buying rice from the market? Uh, for people, they... thank you for the question. Uh, the 650 US dollar is my estimation. 
because one bag uh, equal hundred kilogram. So if one kilogram uh, costs uh, about ten thousand deal, so it's around six hundred fifty uh, US dollar. Uh, and people don't sell the rice actually. They produce the rice for feeding the family for family consumption only. I'm rarely saw people uh, 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 sell the rice after the harvest. Uh, they just keep the rice for the, the for for one year. If at the end of the year they have still have like two batch of rice, they will sell because they will collect the new uh, rice. Uh, so it's not. They just uh, stock it in in at at house and and they will use it for the year. And people say that uh, our rice is better at the rice at the market. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> and people sometimes they say, oh, the rice is a must at the market like a plastic rice. It's not good. It's not good quality like our rice uh -huh. that we use ourselves. There are something like uh, that. And furthermore, people think that if they don't have rice at home, they are very poor. Poor, not poor in money, but they think that having rice is something that is wealthy. And they have to store the rice for one year. Each house, at least, uh, they have some rice at home. If they don't have, have the rice at home, they are very poor. Someone that is very poor is someone that don't have the right to eat. <laughs> so let's uh, jump to the question from Raphael Ducro. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Have the disappearing has the disappearing of mutual aid changed anything in village relationships? Uh, I think the mutual aid uh, there's a change in in mutual aid. The change is from mutual aid to money circulation in the village. It is, I think, the most important thing because one, right now people have to pay for the work. But before we use mutual aid, if you come to my home to help me and go to to uh, to your your house, uh, we don't pay. But right now everyone pay, and I found that it the small village of about uh, had. 1,200 people, there are many grocery stores at, at the village. And the grocery, the grocery store means we have to use money to buy something. People mm -hmm. uh, spend money to buy, uh, use money a lot in the village. It is something like, like that. So they would be paying their neighbors. In the past, they did mutual aid. Now they would pay a neighbor. Yes, they, yes. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily paying people from outside. They can invite some someone outside uh, the village, but we still pay. Yeah. Not as much as uh, like before. Mm -hmm. And that's why we cannot uh, do a transplanting technique because transplanting technique need time and need labor. Labor, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, there's a couple of questions going back to the ritual aspects of this, uh, starting with Courtney again. She says, also your discussion of the desecration of the desecration, consecration of the paddy mounds after the Phnom Srov ceremony. Can you discuss a bit more about the way this is the only way to be sure the rice can be used again? This is very interesting. I'm curious about how people explain this. Mm -hmm. So is this the ritual the only way to make sure that the rice can be used again? After the the consecration and desecration, uh, we, we have actually I don't show you uh, what actually the ritual is. There is a moment of ritual that the turning all around the purple, and purple mean the fertility in Cambodian society. Even the new couple during uh, the wedding, we use purple turning around the couple. And after, after that, the couple will get the fertility, prosperity after the, the ritual. And for the rice, actually, we do the same thing. 
Actually, we use the ritual for the couple during the wedding for the right uh, ritual. And after the, those rituals, those rites will get prosperity, fertility. That's why we prefer to use the rites for the next uh, season. Uh. And then um, continuing on this topic, uh, Raphael Ducro also asked about fertility, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do villagers conceive rice field fertility? Do the Nökta have a role in that? Uh, yes, actually the Nökta mostly uh, uh, protecting uh, the rice field from uh, from from the insect in insect, for example, like that. If there is insect in the village, we go to Nökta to protect uh, to 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 have the to to ask the Nökta to protect uh, the insect or other things and. There is no, no specific uh, ritual that Nyata uh, give the prosperity to the village, but uh, it just I just saw that the ritual of uh, consecration of people are doing that is referred to the prosperity of rice, but uh, Nyata is more protecting or something is protecting. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she also asked, in the ritual, can you use any kind of rice variety? And uh, that's very interesting to me, because I also had meant to ask if the villagers keep a lot of different rice varieties um, in in storage, uh, or do they mostly depend on um, uh, only a single kind? Or, uh, yeah, do they have their own... Um, depository or or um, bank or library of rice varieties um, and and uh, Raphael uh, her question was in the ritual can you use any rice variety uh, thank you for the question uh, at, at home I what I saw they have at least two kinds of rice to cultivating the rice here why they need at least two, because they have, for example, two hectares of the land. They need to use different uh, seed to, to, to cultivate uh, the, the, the rice, because when the harvest it, it has the problem, if not, we have the problem, two hectares of the, the land, we cannot do it uh, in two days or three days, we need to take time. That's why we, we, they select uh, the seed that it will give the production early, and then we have some time for the other rice field. So each family has at least two uh, variety of rice at the village. And in, in the ritual, as people bring uh, many, many rice from their home, so there are many uh, variety of rice that to, to do the party mount. And uh, so there are many uh, variety of rice. There are no specific rice that prefer in the ritual. Uh, everyone can give uh, everything that they, what they have. Actually, it's very symbolic. Uh, I think. <laughs> Another question is uh, actually three questions from Isaac Line. Thank you, Sofia, for a wonderful presentation, he says. I have two questions. Do you notice a change in the way that paddy fields is seen because of chemical fertilizers? For example, the paddy field was the source of protein with water rats, snails, fish, duck eggs. But what about now with the chemical fertilizers? Are they are those protein sources still available? Also, uh, question number two: Do you notice a change uh, in harvesting with the use of a rented machine? And finally, what is the pressure of debt on the changing um, practices of planting and harvest? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the first question related to fertilizer. Uh, people say, know that uh, using uh, 
the fertilizer from the market is not good for the the rice here. They said that the the land is uh, very hard, become hard, and we can get uh, less uh, less uh, yield. But they they don't help. They they don't do. They don't use natural fertilizer. I, so uh, I I I I don't have uh, the answer for for that too. They know actually. They know it's using uh, the fertilizer from the market. It's not good for for the right cultivation. They know everything. They understand that, but they don't uh, produce natural fertilizer. <laughs> But do they still pick up snails and so on from those fields that have been treated with the chemicals? Uh, no, no, they, they no. no, no. Okay. But what about the other two parts here? What happened when they used rented machines? How did that change things? And oh. uh, what happened with the debt, the pressure of debt uh, with these different new practices? Uh, they are happy actually. They are happy they have a, a, a machine to use in the right field because they are hurry, you see, or hurry to, to, to go to work to find money. Yeah. And the, the ox cart yeah, we, uh, is almost uh, disappear in the in Bangkok village. Uh, and uh, every, almost every, um, every house want to buy uh, like a small tractor that I show you to use in uh, in, in the right field. And they said that it's, it's very useful. In Phnom Penh City, we have a car that is good uh, to drive, but at the village, if you have uh, like a small tractor that I show you, it's very useful for, for the family, for the right cultivation, and also for transporting uh, uh, the material. And the then, question. Uh, another question about the canal from Raphael again. Uh, if the canal is uh, collecting rainwater, it still needs maintenance. Is there um, a maintenance organized by the villagers of the canal? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, there is no uh, like system of maintenance in, at, uh, uh, in the village. Uh, when they cannot use the canal, there is no water. They say, the, the chef, the, the village chef can organize something like that, but uh, there is no uh, like formal uh, team to maintain maintaining uh, the canal. Although it's very important for the family, but again, it depends on the the rent. So we, the, this canal cannot have very have much for the villager. And uh, then we have. Uh... I think two questions from anonymous attendee. I think they go well together. Uh, the first one is asking if this village is a village from uh, before 1970, mm -hmm. and uh, how many hectares do each family have? And what is the growth of the population? And what are the demographic changes over the past 30 years? is the first part. And then we can go to the second part is exactly how many hectares do the families own? And also about COVID, how did they change and cultivation methods for a better production ratio during, because of COVID? Mm -hmm. So there are several questions in there. Okay. Uh, Beginning with the history, is was this village in the same place before 1970, mm -hmm. and did they just come back like you were explaining before? Mm -hmm. And then, how many hectares do the families have, and how has population changed? Thank you for the this question. And I actually I talked with uh, Professor Ang Julian, who is a Cambodian scholar. He was on the inscription. He told me that there yeah, is inscription that mentioned the Bangkaung village in an Angkor era. Uh, so it means that the village, uh, yeah, there was a village a uh, long time ago, even before the civil wars in Cambodia. And the, after the civil war, I, I think 
because of the road, if you saw the picture that there is two roads in, in the village and uh, the, the people start to, to live uh, near the road. But before, when I talked with the, the villager, they said that they live with the, their family and the relatives within group of like a round village, not a round village, but a, it's a collective uh, one place and a collective other place. Something like that they call tool, tool, uh, tool to mean uh, yeah. uh, the what, what, yeah. Uh, they, they live next to each other, but right now they change to live near the road. That's what uh, people told me right now. And uh, I forgot the name. Oh, the hectares, hectares per family. Uh, approximately one, uh, one hectare per family. What I'm, I'm asking uh, the people, they said about one hectare, one hectare and half. But the problem right now is uh, because of uh, the the village is near the the, the city. Even though in the Astra Authority zone, the system zone of Uncle. Some uh, some people come here to buy the land, and it because they don't have money, though, so the villagers start to sell their land. Uh, so there is a problem, and we can notice that if there is a pillar, not the border of the land, which means that those land was sold but already. It's very easy to notice because in uh, in the village, people know where their right field is. And if there is a border, it means those land was sold already, and it's easy to notify. And during COVID, I, I saw this question about COVID. Uh, during COVID, people don't go to work at the city because there is no work, uh, and uh, uh, the city is closed, something like that. So they produce rice, and they produce uh, the handicraft. <laughs> That's why they can survive uh, during COVID because they, are, they always have right to eat. They just need some money to buy some food, buy other things, so they can produce the handicraft uh, at home. The problem is that some people borrow the money from the bank. Here is the, the big problem at the, the village. They cannot uh, pay for the interest, pay for the bank. If they don't borrow the money from the bank, it's okay, they can survive. They, I have a right to eat. I can produce the handicraft. I can stay at home. But if the family have to pay the bank, it's a big problem for them. Hmm. And what about that the last part there? Uh, how has population changed? You, I think you mentioned there's 1,200 people now. Yeah. Is that, uh, has it grown a lot in the last few decades? Uh, I cannot find this data uh, with uh, the 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 statistic with the village chef or something like that, and uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but I I I, I have the uh, image satellite image. There is uh, the the village is bigger. The village is bigger. Uh, one professor. Uh, Show me the, the the image of the village, and I, I saw the the village is uh, bigger than before. But I don't know the demographic mm. uh, change in the village. Sorry for for that. Thank you. Now there's um, um, a question and um, a request from Alexia Dayet. Uh, she says, "Hi Bong, thank you very much for your presentation. Is it possible to get your contact to have further exchange?" Uh, she wants mm -hmm. to be in touch. Uh, she says, I am also a PhD about rice in Cambodia. I have been oh. conducting research in Preah Vihar province and Kampong Tom, but I was mainly interested about the rice cultivation and the agrarian changes these provinces are facing. So she wants to get in touch with you. Uh, and um, uh, then um, perhaps we can help facilitate that. Uh, then she also has a question about the change to broadcast rice. This often comes with the use of herbicides, uh, which you don't need for transplanting. 
because you already have water in the plot when transplanting, therefore the seedling of the rice has a head start to and can compete uh, successfully against the weeds. And that minimizes labor requirements for manual weeding and avoids the use of herbicides. Mm. And so she asks, have you also seen this use of herbicide with the broadcast rice? Uh, and there's a comment from Raphael Ducrot saying, the broadcasting method people are using with seedlings has a very high density and then the density diminishes through plowing, plowing when rice is 45 days old. This is also a way to fight weeds. So this is getting very technical. The difference in uh, labor and uh, um, uh, uh, chemical pesticide use between broadcasting and um, and um, uh, and and transplanting uh, into a field that has water, which the weeds cannot uh, cannot beat. So, what is your comment to that uh, technical inquiry? Yeah, thank you for uh, this uh, comment and question. Uh, and I'm I'm happy to exchange with you, uh, Alexia. Maybe you can uh, send an email to CTS, and CTS can more. Uh, facilitate uh, our connection because I want to, I really want to contact, to discuss with someone who are interested in the right cultivation in Cambodia to exchange the ideas, something like that. Actually, for me, um, I don't have, I'm, do, I'm doing the cultural anthropology. I don't have uh, like uh, many knowledge related to specific, uh, like the technique, what if we use this, we will produce more. If we we do that, we will produce less, something like that. Actually, I just, uh, what I'm interested in is uh, what the people say, what the people told me. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to understand what they are doing by, by what they are told, what they are told, what they told me. And I don't have like a technique in dry uh, growing. I, I have no technique about that, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, let's hope we can put you in touch. Alexia, welcome to write to CKS and we will forward your message. Um, uh, last two questions are about uh, rice and rice deities. Siriton uh, Sirivan asks again, is there any rice deity in Cambodian rice culture? How is that deity um, portrayed? he or she. And uh, Jean-Philippe Lagoet um, um, also speaks to this issue, so I'm, I'm reading this together. He says, uh, thanks a lot, Sofia, for the presentation. Rice spirit rituals are common among Austro-Asiatic populations. For example, Bunong people have a specific place in the house where the rice spirit stays. The spirit is brought to the rice field before planting and brought back to the house after harvest both including important ceremonies. Rituals are now gone because of land loss. I guess the rituals in Khmer context are challenged too, as the importance of rice cultivation is challenged by more profitable cultivation like cassava. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, there is, uh, I already replied for the first question related to the right deity. Uh, there is a rice deity in Cambodia called Pai Pai Sram, Pai Sram, but there is no uh, portrait of the this this god. There is only uh, I, there is the rice itself is named for Pai is called in Cambodia, but in uh, Angkorian time we have like uh, uh, the god that called Kuvera something like that. Kuvera that's called uh, this mean uh, the the deity for the the wealthy which has but right now in in Cambodia what uh, I know is a uh, uh, pay uh, we call in Cambodia and uh, there, is, there is researchers that say that the kuvera transformed to mean for pay around 
uh, I, I don't have. Uh, I will. I will look at uh, that uh, that question. But the right itself is the god for Cambodia. It cannot walk on the right in Cambodian context. We think that right is uh, the god. And for example, when I was young, uh, when we are eating in with family, we have to finish all the right. Uh, it's, it's important. And the right itself, you cannot. Uh, there is a story that. Uh, the in Evelyn Pogue Mastero, she said that before we don't cultivate rice, rice reduce itself. And one day there is a, like a couple, the rice come in into the house and they uh, it's very annoying for them and they said they blame the rice so they rice the rice have not come anymore. So people have to produce rice. And the story are uh, still still in, in the village I, I found the story. That's why uh, we have to produce rice, uh, produce rice now today. People uh, still say about the story. Well, thank you so much for um, taking the time, um, Sofia, to answer all the those questions. And I think we have gone through uh, all of them. And we're also over time. So I think we should end here. Uh, we went a little over half an hour of uh, Q&A. Uh, why don't you uh, uh, finish the screen sharing and then we can um, say thanks to everyone. Okay. Uh, here we go. Yes, very good. <laughs> now we have the big picture of you. And uh, I would just like to thank you once again and to thank uh, all the members of the audience for their interest and for their questions, illuminating these issues. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I failed before to thank the staff of the CKS, the Center for Queer Studies, who have been uh, making possible uh, setting up this uh, event for us today. So very many thanks to our staff as well. And uh, we will see you uh, another time at the next uh, webinar in our series. And uh, once again, also welcome to um, the CKS and I want to um, say also to our speaker, uh, Sofia, we look forward to see uh, your research published so we can yeah. read even more about it. <laughs> I very much look forward to that. So thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, CKS, thank the audience.